Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, well, as Ricardo said, uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm <laughs> Jesus Requena. Uh, I'm a lecturer here at Queen Mary in the School of Electronic Engineering and Computer Science and also I'm part of the Center for Intelligent System. And as Ricardo said, I do signal processing, complex system analysis, and I'm very interested in their application to biomedical problems, specifically to cardiac arrhythmias uh, studies. Right? So today what I want to discuss a little bit with you is my approach towards uh, cardiac arrhythmia analysis. And I'm going to start by giving you some very basic ideas about cardiac electrophysiology and then I will go on and, and talk about my, my approach. So the first concept I want you to, uh, to know about is this of um, excuse me. Let me. Okay, I'm going to start talking about bioelectricity, right? So this here is a bioelectric model of a cell. It looks very complicated, but the main thing that you need to, to know is that essentially a cell is this thing, which is a membrane which separates the inside of the cell and the outside. Okay? This is a cardiac cell, a cell that is in, in the heart. Now, inside the cell and outside the cell, there are some ions, and because of these ions, there is a voltage across the membrane. This is what we call the transmembrane uh, voltage. Okay, fine. So uh, if we get one of these cells, and the same, by the way, happens to the neurons, but if we get one of these cells and we apply a stimulus to the cell, there's going to be a sequence of changes, electrical changes, and uh, you see these structures here, they are called ion channels. There's going to be ions moving in and out of the cell, and the end result is going to be that the voltage across the membrane is going to change. So we call this process excitation. So what the cell is going to do is going to change the voltage and then it's going to go back to rest. Okay, so this is the basic idea of bioelectricity, the ability of our cell to produce electricity. The interesting thing about cardiac cells is that this activity, this electrical activity is coupled to some mechanical activity. So when we have this change in the transmembrane potential, there's going to be an increase of uh, concentration of calcium channels inside this and this is going to pro provoke the, the uh, contraction of, of the cell, right? So the main message here again is that cardiac cells they produce electricity and this electricity provokes ultimately the contraction of, uh, of our cell. Now you can imagine that if you put several cells together there's going to be some electrical coupling between cells and uh, if you say you have a row of cells and then you start stimulating one of them, the electrical stimulus is going to propagate from one cell to the next. So what is the end result? The end result is that this electrical activity serves two purposes, contraction and also coordination, right? So if you have an organ, if you have the heart and you apply a stimulus somewhere in the heart, that stimulus is going to propagate and it's going to coordinate all the cells so that they contract at the same time, right? So the, the main basic fundamental idea about uh, cardiac electrophysiology is that the bioelectricity helps our cells to contract and to have a coordinated uh, contraction. So because of this um, propagation of the electrical activity, we are going to have several or different types of rhythms in the, in the heart. So rhythm essentially is a distribution. Yeah, these, these are very, um, maybe unrealistic, but there they are, they are two examples of how a rhythm could be represented. In this case, each color represents a voltage, and what we can see here is that the voltage is propagating in a very, very regular fashion. Here, the activity is more random, okay? So there are two different types of heart rhythms. This is regular, and this is irregular. So the concept of arrhythmia is precisely an abnormal rhythm that, uh, or a rhythm that is different from the normal rhythm, rhythm of, of the heart. Right? So we have talked about bioelectricity, we are talking about cardiac arrhythmias and now we are going to talk about a third factor which is very important and it's actually, it doesn't have any physiological purpose and the idea is that the human body is like a big resistor. So it happens that the electrical activity that the heart generates can be measured from other points. So if we place some electrodes on our body, we will be able to measure indirectly the electricity that the heart is producing. So this is what we call uh, a cardiac signal. So what you can, we, you can see here is that maybe by having a look at those signals we can say something about the heart. Here this is an example of uh, 
uh, a distribution of uh, electrodes on the body surface actually this is the electrode system that my colleagues from the hospital Gregory Marañón in Madrid are using. It has 60 odd electrodes, but probably you also know about the ECG, the electrocardiogram, which is the standard uh, cardiac signal that doctors use to infer the activity of the heart, right? So, basic idea of cardiac electrophysiology, by having a look at some electrical measurements, we can say something about the activity of the heart. Now, the main question, in, well, one of the main questions, or from my point of view, a very important question in cardiac electrophysiology is what are the best sensing locations? Where should we put our electrodes? How many electrodes should we use to infer the activity of the heart? Right? So, we are going to move now from cardiac electrophysiology to engineering to maths, and I'm going to propose this sort of translation of terms so that we connect both uh, both fields. So essentially what we call in cardiac electrophysiology a rhythm or an arrhythmia in mathematical terms is a set of spatial temporal dynamics, right? It's a system whose activity can be described both in time and in space. When we talk about something like diagnosis, in mathematical terms means characterization or identification of those spatial temporal dynamics. And we can even go and say, well, prevention and treatment is controlling my system so that the spatial temporal dynamics are the ones that I, that I want to, to have. So how do, I, do we formulate this problem? Well, it's very simple. Essentially we have, this is the activity of the heart, these are the cardiac signals. We know that cardiac activity produces some cardiac signals, so our problem is given some cardiac signals, some observations, what is the activity of the heart? Right? Sounds looks like deconvolution or something like that. Uh, classically, we have used many signal processing approaches, and essentially what we do is we get our signals, we compute some parameters, and those parameters can be temporal, spectral, fractal, there are, there are many different types of, of parameters. And then by analyzing them, we want to know whether those parameters say something about the dynamics of, of the heart, of, about the activity of the heart. This is a, a classical signal processing approach, right? Now, um, by doing this like in a blind fashion, if you will, we miss a lot, right? This is an example here, sorry, this signal here. This is an example of the power of spectrum of a cardiac signal. This cardiac signal, just if, if you want to know it, is actually a cardiac signal that has been recorded by introducing an electrode inside the heart. So this is the spectrum, the power spectrum. We get MATLAB, we ask MATLAB to compute the power spectrum, we get this, and we can calculate this dominant frequency, this peak frequency, mean frequency, and so on. So, given those spectral parameters, can we say anything about, about the rhythm? Well, the problem with this approach, this sort of blind approach, is that um, what our intuition is telling us might not be what is actually happening. And here I'm going to give you one example for this power spectrum. If we use all the tools, everything that we know, the theory that we know about how uh, electrical potentials propagate, we can establish this very simple linear relationship between the signals that we measure and the cardiac activity. So say that X is the voltage around the heart and Y is the voltage on the thorax. We know that the voltage uh, uh, on the thorax is a linear combination of the cardiac sources. So what happens here? And it's very easy to see if you, for instance, get to cosine signals and add them, is that the spectrum of the sum, or the spectrum of a linear combination, is not the same as, as the linear combination of the spectra, right? So we have some distorting effects. In 2013 we published a paper in which we described analytically how these distortions occurred, but the main home message, take home message here, is that um, when we compute some parameters the electrode system might be producing some distortion and at the end those parameters that you're looking at might not be reflecting what's happening to the heart but it's something totally unrelated or something just related to the to the measurement system so for me the main message here is that if we want to have a proper signal 
processing approach in cardiac electrophysiology, we really need to have a good model of our signals, right? This is, this is in my opinion, vital. So how can we use these bioelectrical models that we have? Well, this is what we call an inverse problem approach for cardiac electrophysiology. We said before that the potentials that we measure, they are a linear combination of the potentials around the heart. So we can pose this problem here. We can say, well, what is, if, if I have Y, what's X, right? So we can think of applying some fancy methods to actually obtain the inverse of this. Now, as you might imagine, there will be fewer points, fewer measurement points that, than points on the heart that we want to estimate, which means that our problem is undetermined, right? Which means that there will be many solutions for the distribution of potentials that we have. So what do we have to do? We need to choose one. How do we choose it? Well, what we usually do is some kind of regularization like this one here, and then we come up with a solution like this. This is fine. I mean, you do the math and then you decide that X, the voltage around the heart, is this combination of the uh, measurements on the, on the thorax. This is just one example. Now, what happens here? We need to ask ourselves whether the solution that we obtain like this is physiologically meaningful, right? We need to ask ourselves whether the heart can have a distribution of potentials X like the one that we're proposing, we also need to think whether this is accurate or not, right? Whether there's a margin of error that makes the solution actually useless because it won't be able to distinguish two different rhythms. We need to ask ourselves if it's numerically stable. So if I move a little bit these measurements, am I going to get a completely different solution here? So one way of uh, uh, facing these problems is by exploiting what we call ph physiological priors, which means adding some extra information about the way those voltages uh, around the heart behave. We can have something like, well, X, the voltage at the heart, cannot have just any value. The value is going to be between minus 90 millivolts and 20 millivolts. That, those are physiological values. We know that there is some kind of spatial correlation, meaning that two nearby points are going to have similar voltages. There's going to be temporal correlation in the sense that one point in two different time instants that are very close to one another, they're going to have more or less the same voltage. So we can reformulate our problem and we can come up with different optimization formulation that give us some solutions that we believe they are physiologically more uh, meaningful. So as you can see, what we are doing here is we are not just processing signals as a sequence of numbers, but we are using what we know about the heart to compute what we think is the best, the best solution, which means amongst all the solutions that we have, which one is the, 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 the best, right? So now I'm going to move a little bit to what we call computer simulation in uh, cardiac electrophysiology. And the basics are the following. If you remember the first or the second slide, I showed you one model of cell in which there was a membrane. We talked about, about some voltage. We talked about some ion channels, which is essentially are like pores through which ions flow. There are mathematical models for this for these cells, right? So there is an equation for the voltage, another equation for the ion current A, B, C, and so on. So we can put them together and we can have a numerical model of, uh, of the electrical activity of one cell. We can also couple many cells together and we can have a model of cardiac tissue, of a collection of cells that are coupled to one another. And we can use these models and we can simulate the activity of cardiac tissue. Here I'm showing you two simulations of two different types of dynamics that are supposed to be behind one arrhythmia which is known as fibrillation. Okay? During this arrhythmia called fibrillation, the heart is not beating in a synchronous manner. What they, des they describe fibrillation as a bag of worms where 
in some parts of the heart there is contractions in some of the parts there are relaxation so the heart is going something like this not like synchronously right so this is these two images here they correspond to two different simulations of two different mechanisms that seem to be uh, behind uh, what we call cardiac fibrillation now we can couple or we can get these cardiac activity models and we can put them on a geometrical model of the heart so we can make a numerical model of the heart where we have uh, cardiac activity propagating across the, the the muscle we can also put the model inside a model of the thorax okay and by combining all these models together we can simulate actually cardiac signals and this is very nice because usually when we analyze cardiac signals we have the signals but we can't see the heart in other words so you have a patient you record the signals and you make some guesses about what the heart is doing but we cannot really check whether the heart is doing that or not in this case we have all the information we have the signals and we have also the activity of the heart so here we can really check whether our signal processing uh, proposals make sense or not so we get our signal we compute some parameters and we see whether those parameters tell us about the dynamics what we think that they are telling us but we can go one step further like as follows we can propose what we call state space approaches towards uh, cardiac signal analysis and this is very related to in a very abstract way I hope you, you can see the connection to tracking problems so what we can do is to follow say that we have some observation well what we are going to do is we are going to have a computer that implements a model for the cardiac activity okay which is going to be this one here don't worry too much about the actual formulation but this is a box that simulates our heart then we have another box that simulates our thorax so we produce signals Y we simulate signals Y based on a model of a heart right then we are going to compare our simulated signals with our observed or measured signals and we are going to compute what we call an observation error so if the signal that I'm simulating and the signal that I'm measuring they are the same that means that the underlying cardiac activity is a good candidate if there's a little bit of a discrepancy we are going to correct our cardiac activity okay so essentially what we are doing is imagine we describe the dynamics of my heart as this point moving like this and here I have one observation we have we are going to have a computer trying to follow these points right so that's why I call this a tracking problem because I use my measurements to correct the state of a system that I'm simulating so by doing this essentially I'm using my measurements to construct the cardiac dynamics that are supposed to be underlying them so this is the current our current line of research what we want to do is precisely to combine all the numerical methods that we have developed over the years where we have models of the cardiac electrical activity models of cardiac signals we want to combine them by following the state space approach with uh, measurements of cardiac signals and we are going to try to infer the, uh, the electrical activity of the heart by using measurements through this combination of signal processing and uh, modeling of the cardiac activity now the only thing that in my opinion we need to be very worried about is about the actual model of uh, cardiac activity we need a model obviously that is good enough and fast enough right so what we are using is a very very simple model of cardiac activity that actually has only two states this is the excited state and the rest state the dynamics the transitions between one and the other they are defined probabilistically and we have found that this sort of model is good enough to uh, reproduce very complex dynamics in the heart and is very fast because it doesn't involve uh, 
solving for their voltage for their, for many ion currents and, and so on. As an example, we have used actually this very simple model in a different field in neurophysiology, and uh, we used it to analytically obtain the distribution of what in neurophysiology we call interspike intervals, which is the times between the firing of, of neurons. And we obtained really, really good, really good results. And actually, based on the, our exact solution, we could obtain really nice uh, analytical approximation for, approximations for, for this distribution, such as the, the Rayleigh distribution. Okay, so uh, I have explained what our approach is, how we want to combine signal process, or how we are combining signal processing and modeling and simulation. But the open question that I phrased earlier is still there. So, what are the best sensing locations? And what are the best sensing locations, as I say here, for characterizing arrhythmias? Okay, and in, my, in my opinion, this question is a little bit too vague because even though qualitatively we can talk about arrhythmias, we don't have within this mathematical formalism, formalism a very, very precise definition of, of arrhythmias. So the state space approach that I presented earlier, which was introduced as a purely numerical approach for analyzing uh, cardiac arrhythmias, I believe that it can be used in a more abstract way to answer this question. So another line of research that uh, we have opened is using this formalism to answer these very, very uh, abstract questions. And what we are doing is the following. First of all, cardiac arrhythmias, in a very abstract way, we are, sim we are modeling them as some trajectory in some space. So you can imagine some point moving like this. This is one type of cardiac rhythm. It could be moving like this. This is another type of rhythm. It could be a little bit here. This is another one, and so on. So this is, for me, a cardiac arrhythmia. Or, to be more precise, a group of trajectories like this one and the one underneath, those two, they are the same arrhythmia, right? So this is what we call cardiac arrhythmias from this mathematical perspective. Now, identifying arrhythmias, we interpret it as being able to identify or distinguish in these trajectories, right? So if I have this trajectory here and another one underneath and I cannot distinguish them because to me they look like they are the same thing, for me they are the same arrhythmia, okay? So the question of uh, identifying arrhythmias and distinguishing those trajectories in my space, what I, what I do is essentially I I apply the idea that when we are sensing, we are identifying different regions in our space, right? So the question that we need to answer is, number one, if I have a system of sensors on my body, my sensor distribution or my sensing points essentially are partitioning the space. So if this is my space and my sensors partition the space in one, two, three, and four different regions, that means that I will be able to distinguish one, two, three, and four different types of arrhythmias. And then, if I have an arrhythmia, or as we call them, a set of trajectories, and I want to be able to identify them, I need to be able to have a set of sensors that essentially partitions that piece of space where my arrhythmia lives. Right? So we can see that, by, uh, in my opinion, this approach, this very abstract approach, which maybe you can connect to some other information theoretic approaches, this can help us to answer the question of how many sensing uh, positions do I need? How should I distribute my sensors on the body surface? Because in, in my opinion, it gives us a very specific, a very clear definition of arrhythmia. Clear is a bit relative here, but anyway. And uh, it can tell us what it means to be distinguishing trajectories or identifying uh, trajectories within the, the state space. So, uh, 
this is where I finished my presentation as a summary. Yes, I use signal processing, computer modeling. I use them for a purely, if you will, uh, analysis, uh, well, measurement analysis uh, aim. So if I have a set of signals and I want to know what the heart is doing, I combine these two techniques, but then I also want to apply this approach, this space, state space approach to answer some more abstract uh, ideas such as what is the relationship between my sensing uh, locations and my ability to distinguish different types of, of arrhythmias and this is where I conclude. I want to thank again everyone for uh, listening to me and, and the organizers for inviting me for this talk. If you have any question I will be more than happy to to try to answer.